Okay, I think we'll get started. Hello, everyone. I'm Joanne Gabriel. And on behalf of Darien Library and the Museum of Darien, we welcome you to this evening's program, Historic Bridges of the Merritt Parkway, with the Executive Director of the Merritt Parkway Conservancy, Wes Haynes. If you drive along the Merritt Parkway, you will notice the unique and beautiful design of each of the bridges that you go under. From classical revival to art deco, each bridge is one of a kind and has a wonderful history. This tour will examine their design sources and will place them within the context of other bridges over time, including a behind the scenes peek at recent restorations being done to them. Before we begin, I would like to mention that programs at Darien Library are made possible by the annual Friends of the Library campaign. We thank you for your support to make programs like this possible and our collections available to the community. Our presenter this evening is currently the executive director of the Merritt Parkway Conservancy and literally grew up driving the Merritt. The Merritt Parkway Conservancy is a nonprofit member supported organization that works to protect, revitalize and steward Connecticut's largest and most heavily used historic place and scenic byway and has been doing so since 2002. A Stanford resident who has had a 40 year career in architectural preservation. He has taught at such institutions as the Parsons School of Design, RPI in Troy, New York, and the Brooklyn High School for the Arts. It is my pleasure to introduce to you our lecturer this evening, Wes Haynes. Thank you, Joanne, and welcome everyone. Um, we're going to take a pretty quick tour of the parkway tonight. Um, there's a lot of bridges to see, and uh, we'll, uh, we'll spend a little time with, with some of the most uh, impressive ones. Um, and I'd also like to acknowledge tonight um, that uh, this program is, is supported by our members um, and the estate of Henry Merritt, um, who uh, uh, has uh, bequested a, a very large gift to us to, uh, to continue our programs. Uh, the Conservancy, uh, we mostly work behind the scenes with DOT um, to, to protect the parkway and to see that the work is, is done within preservation guidelines. Uh, but uh, part of our program is to reach out to the public and to answer questions about the parkway and to, uh, to basically talk about the parkway and get people excited about it. Um, we're very excited about the parkway. So um, let's start with um, a... Uh, Let's see, I got to get the controls going here. Uh, just to define what we're talking about tonight, uh, the Merritt Parkway is that 39 and a half mile stretch of parkway that's in Fairfield County uh, that runs from the New York line to uh, the Kustanik River and the Sikorsky Bridge. Um, the parkway was first proposed in 1924 to reroute uh, cars away from trucks on Route 1, uh, which runs along the shore. Um, and, uh, but it, it, was a, it was very difficult to introduce a road this size into the context of Fairfield County. Fairfield County was very developed along the shore. And so the parkway was located about seven miles inland from the shore, uh, which were mostly old farmland and private estates at that point. Uh, the land was acquired uh, for the parkway uh, without any eminent domain. It was all by acquisition. Um, and it was uh, a very popular project uh, once um, everybody had an idea of what it was going to be and how what in, an extraordinary road it would become. Um, it was sold to the public uh, as being uh, more than just a, a highway, but a, a beautiful place to drive your car. Um, it was designed between 1934 and 1940 and constructed in four years between 1936 and 40. Uh, construction started at both ends of the parkway and moved towards the center. Um, it was listed on the National Register of Historic Places in 1991 uh, by the National Park Service. And that's a really important designation for this road and why it looks different from the Westchester County Parkway system um, and why it looks different from the Wilbur Cross, which is the extension of the parkway to the east that runs towards New Haven. Uh, because all federal money that has been spent on the parkway since 1991 has had to comply with preservation guidelines. So they have to be restorative in nat nature. 
Um, and, uh, and, it, um, and I think you can, as you cross the New York line, you can really sense the difference today. Our organization was founded in 2002. We're 20 years old uh, this year, and uh, we've been working uh, with those guidelines with DOT uh, to on a multi-phase uh, rehabilitation of the parkway of the entire 39 and, and a half miles. And if you've been around for uh, the last 15 years, you've probably sat in traffic at some point, and I apologize for that. Uh, but once those uh, Jersey barriers are removed, um, the, the, it's like revealing something behind a hidden curtain, uh, the parkway comes alive. And, and we're very excited that we're closing in on the end of the rehabilitation. Uh, which should be done in two years. So uh, we're, tonight we're just going to visit, we're going to focus on just the bridges, which are a very important part of the parkway. Um, the, uh, the, the parkway was designed with 69 bridges. Uh, most of them are above the parkway, but the parkway also crosses over a number of roads. So there are, parkway, there are bridges that, unless you live near the parkway and uh, go uh, underneath it uh, every now and then, you're not even really aware that you're going over a bridge. We'll look at a few of those tonight too. Uh, the, the, the unique thing about the Merritt Parkway is that uh, the 69 bridges are all unique in design. They're all one-offs. Um, and uh, this was an extremely unusual uh, thing for its time. And it is an exceptional thing today to, to have a survival. Uh, we've only lost two of the bridges of the original bridges over time um, that were taken out for, for uh, major interchange improvements. Uh, so we have a really extraordinary collection of bridges here. Um, it's, it's often been said that uh, uh, rumors abound of, of how the parkway bridges were designed. Some, some rumors suggest that, uh, that the bridges were designed uh, by individual architects. Everybody was trying to outdo each other. Um, uh, there's also a myth that uh, they were all designed at an overnight charrette at the Yale School of Architecture um, with a lot of alcohol involved. Um, they are very, very unusual bridges, but they were actually all the design of one architect, uh, a, a man named George Dunkelberger, who we'll meet in a few minutes. The uh, structures of the bridges uh, most of them are a very simple structure that was common in the 1930s um, uh, called a rigid frame. Um, they're, though largely the structure is steel uh, hidden within concrete. For most of them, the steel is embedded completely within concrete. And um, it's, uh, the web of the steel narrows to the middle of the bridges and, um, and is kind of heavier out towards the, the side. And that allows um, an architectural treatment in the form of a, of a very gentle segmental arch, uh, which gives the, the bridges a lot of grace. Uh, the uh, structural engineer for all the bridges was Leslie Summer, um, who was a very uh, talented uh, major engineer in, in uh, Connecticut. Um, and he really dealt with uh, um, uh, four different structural types. So the rigid frame and then post and beam uh, which was really just coming in to be state of the art when the parkway was designed. In fact, the German Autobahn uh, underpasses were all uh, designed with, uh, with um, post and beam uh, construction where they were just simple, you went through a simple box uh, rectangular opening. Um, and that was eventually uh, adopted by the interstate highway system that came in in the 1950s in the United States to pretty mind numbing um, repetition across the American landscape. Uh, so that is sort of the industry standard that we're all dealing with today on most of the highways. And the merit is different because um, there were different uh, configurations. Uh, there are only a couple of actual structural arches and perhaps the most beautiful one is uh, Guinea Road uh, Bridge in Stamford uh, that is actually a structural arch. Um, it was one of the first bridges to be built. It was also one of the most expensive and to save money, they cut back. Uh, they moved away from uh, natural stone facing and uh, they switched to concrete facing. 
And um, uh, there's one major bridge that you never see from the parkway, but you go over it. Uh, it crosses the Saugatuck River in Westport. Um, it's based on a structural design uh, by Charles Eiffel from the 1880s, but uh, Sumner uh, adapted it for a larger span and a different, um, uh, different load capacity. Um, but it's a, um, an open spandrel uh, bridge that uh, um, is uh, a very, very beautiful object from down on the river. Uh, you really need to be in a kayak or a canoe to see this and appreciate this bridge. So George Dunkelberger was, um, uh, was not a household name uh, of, of, among American architects. Uh, he grew up in Camden, New Jersey. Um, he was educated at Drexel uh, Institute in Philadelphia. Uh, Drexel was uh, one of a group of, of uh, uh, colleges, uh, sort of like Cooper uh, Union in New York City, uh, Pratt Institute in uh, Brooklyn, uh, that were set up to encourage um, people from modest means to, to get an education in a practical uh, trade. Drexel was different from the other schools in that it offered a kind of a renaissance uh, look of uh, more of a liberal arts uh, kind of uh, approach to education than, uh, than the other uh, schools where you could just focus on, on the one sector of, uh, of business that you wanted to go into. Uh, Dunkelberger studied in, in, uh, um, in architecture. Uh, but he also get a, got a very rounded education in the humanities there. And on the lower left here um, is one of his buildings that, um, that he built uh, prior to the crash. Uh, he, uh, he set up practice in Hartford, Connecticut and, um, and did uh, a number of, of commercial buildings um, in, in the Hartford area. And you can sort of see uh, in the parapet of the building uh, on the lower left that uh, a, a kind of a, a sense of some of the bridges uh, that he would eventually design for the parkway. Uh, but after the crash, he couldn't get any work and uh, he was offered a job at DOT to basically come on board, uh, which was then the Connecticut uh, Department of Highways uh, to come on board to design um, the bridges for the Merrick Parkway. And that's the only photograph we have of him on his wedding day um, uh, appropriately uh, standing in front of a car, uh, which uh, uh, would be good. We don't know enough about George Dunkelberger, uh, but he really was quite a talented guy. Um, his design principles for the parkway uh, in an article that he wrote um, for an engineering magazine um, that uh, he sort of summarized what they were trying to do on the parkway. And I think he really accomplished um, these objectives. Uh, we believe that these bridges are pleasing to the eye. Uh, they represent a radical departure from highway bridges, which they sort of do, but they sort of don't. And we'll look at that in a minute. And they are decidedly individual in character. And that is very, very much the case with the Merritt Parkway's bridges. Now, um, to put the bridges in context, um, they were, uh, we can look at the Merrick Parkway's bridges at the, as sort of the last iteration of two movements. One was a, a, a much longer movement that we'll look at in a minute, but the first was uh, the City Beautiful movement, um, which was a period of American architecture and design, especially urban design, uh, that sought to try to remedy some of the ravages of, of the industrialization of America uh, in the mid 19th century and to give it a gentle edge. And uh, Central Park is considered to be the, uh, the kickoff of the American, uh, of the City Beautiful movement in America. Um, uh, Olmsted was looking at uh, English parks and, uh, and Central Park. Um, uh, he and his partner, Calvert Vaux, designed a number of bridges, uh, none of which were identical. Um, and it was the first demonstration, uh, practical demonstration of, of segregating different types of traffic. So you could have a horse trail crossing a pedestrian trail. And um, it was a very complicated weave of, of different uses that could meander and enjoy, everybody could enjoy the park from a different vantage, um, all made possible by these bridges. Um, this is before the automobile, but it's established the precedent for this 
a different iteration of different bridges uh, that would eventually be picked up um, by the, in the Merritt Parkway, which is considered by many scholars to be the last gasp of the City Beautiful movement in the United States. Uh, the City Beautiful movement was given um, an enormous boost at the Chicago World's Fair, uh, by which, uh, which time in 1893, uh, we had a lot of architects who were trained at the Ecole de Beaux-Arts in Paris, and, um, and the, uh, the, the fashionable style in architecture was classicism. Um, it was the American Renaissance, a revival of the Italian Renaissance, which was a, a revival itself of um, classical antiquity uh, forms from then. So um, Olmsted, um, uh, Frederick Law Olmsted, who designed Central Park, was also did the master plan for the World's Columbian Exposition in Chicago. And um, it was all about the concept of ensemble, how buildings work together, how different uh, landscape features work together and, and, and played well together. And uh, that is a major factor of the Merritt Parkway, which would be designed uh, some 40 years later. The Parkway is also um, uh, very, very influenced by the uh, Paris Exposition Internationale uh, des Arts Décoratifs and Industriels Modernes. And, um, and that was the, um, uh, the, uh, the fair in Paris. Uh, in 1925 that introduced um, uh, Art Deco, which was a kind of a design movement that was percolating up uh, from the post-World War I period uh, to the world in a big way. So uh, we have these two different impulses going on on the Merritt Parkway bridges uh, that are designed in the 1930s. Um, the last iteration of classicism uh, before World War II and, um, and a really unusual uh, uh, demonstration of, of the principles of Art Deco uh, and its, uh, its successor styles um, in the Parkway Bridges. So let's uh, let's just go back uh, even farther um, because this is the second trend that the Parkway sort of uh, at this point represents the end of, and that is um, in Western culture uh, the decoration of bridges, and um, and this uh, this bridge which um, is in Rimney that uh, dates from about 20 um, current era, um, is, uh, is close to 2000 uh, years old at this point, um, and is really one of the first uh, decorated bridges, probably decorated uh, in honor of, the, of a visit from the emperor of Rome uh, to Rimney. Um, and, uh, and we'll see this vocabulary carried through over 2000 years, not as a continuous uh, flow, but at, at these periodic events um, and um, in uh, classical antiquity, it, it originates, it's revived in the Renaissance and then it's carried through in the American City Beautiful movement. Um, and it, uh, this bridge has a, a number of features that you're gonna see on the parkway bridges, um, especially ornamental niches. We don't really know what these ornamental niches were for. They were probably decorated for a visit uh, by the emperor. Um, we have uh, arch, uh, round arch construction. Here it's structural. Um, the uh, the, the uh, bridge is capped off with a, a belt course uh, that's carried by corbels. Um, we'll see those um, rendered in concrete on the Merritt Parkway. And, um, and it's uh, faced with ashlar stone, um, stone laid in a regular pattern. And we'll see that imitated a lot on the Merritt Parkway. Um, here's a, a, some examples of a, of a couple of, of niches um, that are carried over. On the left, on the Eastern, Eastern Turnpike Bridge, um, a little niche with the Juliet balcony and a, and a niche on the Round Hill Road Bridge. This is the first bridge you encounter coming in from the New York line. And uh, this, is, this is how Dunkelberger interpreted really abstracted the, the principles of these classical bridges uh, down in a way that uh, the Westchester Parkway system had not done. Um, it was a very creative and modern way to uh, abstract uh, classical architecture um, into a, a different form. And uh, this is the, uh, the full Easton uh, Road, or also known as Sport Hill Road uh, Bridge, uh, and what it looks like. 
So in the Renaissance, um, uh, the architects of the Renaissance rediscovered uh, the wonders of classical antiquity uh, um, that was uh, 1500 years out of, uh, out of style at that point and uh, began to play with it then in the same way that Dunkelberger was playing with it uh, in the 20th century. And, um, and here's a bridge by, uh, designed by Michelangelo, although he didn't live to see it completed, uh, in Florence, uh, considered one of the most beautiful bridges um, of, of the Renaissance. And um, uh, some details of this, how, how uh, Michelangelo uh, interpreted it. Uh, for one thing, it's on a river and, um, and there are on the piers of the bridge, there are these pointed objects with sort of ship prow um, uh, profiles. Uh, They're called cutwaters on the pylons. Uh, we'll see those introduced on the Merritt Parkway, although they're not dividing any water. And then at the center of the arch spans, um, there's a, a, a decorative feature uh, called a cartouche that just sort of uh, brings attention to the uh, to the uh, the weakest point of the arch where it, where it falls together. And then um, uh, Michelangelo also, because these these bridges um, were used for commercial traffic, this was the major way things were moved around in the Renaissance. Uh, the elliptical arch worked, worked much better than the round uh, round Roman arch. Um, to uh, allow more vessels, more traffic through. And we'll see that Dunkelberger uses that to great effect too. And another famous bridge from the Renaissance in Venice um, is, uh, is this bridge, uh, which also, um, because the Venetians tend to decorate everything, um, had relief sculpture on it, um, and also a very ornamental balustrade uh, for pedestrian traffic. All the merit bridges um, carry pedestrian. They all have uh, sidewalks except for one on, uh, across them, uh, although they're mostly in areas that don't get a lot of heavy foot traffic. And uh, so they have some sort of barricade uh, to, to divide uh, pedestrians from uh, the traffic. Uh, but there's also a lot of relief architect a lot of relief decorative work that goes into the uh, merits bridges that we'll see. And that comes out of this. Renaissance Venetian tradition. So by the, uh, uh, the, the early 20th century, um, we, uh, uh, at the sort of end of the city beautiful movement, um, we see um, a couple of really major bridges built. And one is the Arlington Bridge that connects uh, um, Washington with Arlington Cemetery, designed by McKim Mead and White, uh, famous New York architects, although none of the partners were still alive at this point, uh, in 1932, um, which is uh, a very modern bridge clad with um, a very traditional looking forms, but with a very modern interpretation. You can sort of get a sense of Michelangelo's and the Venetian arch um, on these, although it's not really handling a lot of boat traffic in 1932. Um, it's mostly decorative and you see relief work on it. Um, it's a very beautiful bridge and it's part of a larger plan, uh, City Beautiful plan for Washington um, that, uh, that was executed. Um, you can see some of the same aspects on uh, the Newtown Turpipe Bridge, which was just restored um, and reopened uh, earlier this year. Um, this building, had, uh, this uh, bridge had been under uh, a restoration, a complete new face on it um, for uh, about six years and, um, uh, and reopened this year um, as uh, the, all the woodwork and the scaffolding came down and revealed um, this, this new uh, refreshed face of the bridge. And uh, you, know, you can get a sense of the proportions and, and how simplified uh, that, uh, that Dunkelberger was working. He was expressing the, 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 the stones that, that form the arch uh, they're called voussoirs. He was expressing those uh, on the bridge, even though there are no stones on this bridge at all. It's all concrete and steel and, um, and different uh, sim simple classical details with the same proportions as the McKimmon and White Bridge. Um, here's a, a Frenchtown Road Bridge in Trumple, Trumbull um, that uh, has a very prominent cut water um, in the median. Uh, that is really just a decorative feature here. Um, 
Uh, there was a need to buttress this pile on. It's a very heavy bridge, uh, but Dunkelberger treated it as a, a Renaissance uh, cut water. And uh, um, here is Ponus Ridge Road. This is the bridge that was lit at the beginning, um, both before and after its restora recent restoration about 10 years ago, uh, with a cartouche in the middle, uh, but very, very simplified classical detailing. Again, an abstraction of, of classicism, not a, a, a very archaeologically derived uh, interpretation of classicism. Uh, one of my favorite bridges uh, for its decorative qualities is the Stanwich Road Bridge. Again, a kind of a classical form, uh, very, very simplified, but with these wonderful, um, uh, at the top of the pylons, these wonderful key uh, elements, automobile keys, uh, and then uh, detailed with a, uh, a winged tire, which was um, the sort of a early symbol for the automobile age. Of mechanized transit, um, and then you know, with a, a vine of of um, of, of uh, relief flowers crawling up around it, uh, a very unusual one-off, a very singular detail. Um, Dunkelberger left the uh, modeling of uh, of the actual ornament uh, to a very talented um, New Haven-based uh, sculptor by the name of Edward Ferrari. Um, whose father had trained in Italy and, uh, and Edward trained at the Yale School of Arts. And, um, and so this was, a, a, he would sort of indicate where he wanted something and Ferrari would come up with the, the actual uh, plaster uh, uh, maquette for the, the parkway bridges. And as you can see on the right, uh, the bridge um, is not in the best condition right now. Um, we're, we're, we will need to readdress this bridge soon. Uh, but one of the things that you can see at, at the bottom of the arch is uh, where um, oversized vehicles keep slamming into our beautiful bridges and damaging them. Um, GPS um, that keeps driving the trucks onto the parkway. Um, and we're trying, we're working with Senator Blumenthal to try to get that changed um, in the Commerce Committee in, in Washington. Uh, North uh, Bridge in, uh, in Greenwich is another um, uh, very uh, simplified classical, but here it's almost abstracted just down to, the, to stones and, and balustrade. Uh, there's really nothing superfluous on it, but it's a highly decorative bridge um, that, uh, that otherwise could have just been a plain concrete bridge. Um, this, the lines of the, the ashlar blocks are, are scored into the, the, uh, the face stones. And, uh, and this is what it looks like close up. It, it's very, very abstract um, and, and quite elegant. Um, this, uh, this bridge in Trumbull is um, uh, uh, even simpler. It doesn't have any vertical lines on uh, the ashlar uh, that, that crosses it. It's just a series of horizontal lines. And with um, the Marvin Ridge Bridge, uh, which is very close to Darien in New Canaan, um, you can see the um, uh, another sort of uh, iteration of, of decoration with these urns, these Adam-esque urns uh, that uh, suggest uh, English Palladian uh, classicism, but it's only a suggestion. Um, this, this bridge would have never uh, appeared in the, um, in the 18th century, and, um, and it really just sort of recalls that. The parkway was built uh, during the 350th anniversary of the New Haven, of the settlement of the New Haven colony. And, um, and so there was a sense, a little bit of a sense of colonial revival um, with the bridge, with, with, the, with some of the bridges. So um, that, that, that's just a taste of some of the classical features on, on the parkway. Uh, uh, now we'll look at the impact of the Paris Exposition on, on some of the iconography of the bridges. Uh, the, the Paris um, uh, Expo uh, featured uh, the main uh, design elements were uh, a series of fountains. Um, one was the central uh, focal feature of the, the fair plan itself on the left. 
And uh, one of the other ones um, was this uh, really dramatic perfume fountain that, that flowed perfumes through it, designed by the artist Lalique um, out of glass. And um, it was inside one of the pavilions. And, um, and a lot of the Art Deco vocabulary comes out of this fountain, this 1925 fountain uh, play. So on the parkway, we see a lot of uh, water um, rendered in concrete. Uh, on the left, um, in, a, in a style called sgraffito, which is a polychromatic uh, concrete casting uh, of, a, of a panel that uh, the, the pieces are cast in, in two different colors uh, permanently. And on the right, just in a, a relief of a kind of a fountain feature that is uh, quite, uh, quite exciting. Um, and uh, 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 no, this is a detail of the North uh, Bridge we just looked at with the sgraffito. And um, you can see also in the ironwork on the railing, uh, the fountain motif uh, repeated as well. Um, this one, this uh, bridge has very prominent vertical lines, which was uh, also a, a characteristic of Art Deco architecture um, and, uh, and get, gives the building a lot of wonderful, or the, the bridge a lot of wonderful shadow play. Uh, the fountain uh, it sort of, uh, the, the ironwork sort of conveys the uh, Lalique fountain, um, as does um, the White Oak Shade Bridge, the uh, relief on the White Oak Shade Bridge, which is a very stylized fountain of water jets uh, spraying off uh, playfully onto the, onto the right. So Dunkelberger came up with basically two, um, two designs for each bridge that he designed. And, um, and it went before a committee that was chaired by uh, Congress, uh, former Congressman Schuyler Merritt, um, who the Parkway is named for, uh, who was the chairman of the Merritt Parkway Commission. And the commission made the, the call on that. And, uh, and so there are really like close to 140 bridges designed for the Merritt Parkway of which uh, 69 were built. And this is the... Uh, White Oak Shade Bridge as it looks uh, completely. Um, and uh, the South Avenue Bridge in New Canaan, not too far from Darien as well, um, uh, is, it also has this fountain, but it has another um, uh, feature that was uh, prominent at the uh, 1925 uh, fair in Paris. And that was um, an Aztec revival uh, pavilion uh, for one of the galleries. Uh, that had a large sunburst motif over the main entrance to it. And Dunkelberger seemed to be fascinated, and many other architects were as well, by this sort of Aztec uh, symbolism and, uh, and used it as a detail on this overpass. And he used this detail on a couple of other overpasses, including the Long, uh, Long Ridge Road in Stanford. Uh, another sort of Aztec-like design um, is, can be found um, on the, um, uh, the Morehouse uh, Turnpike Bridge, which um, is uh, uh, modeled sort of in, in a, a riff on a Frank Lloyd Wright house done in the 20s, about uh, 10 years before this was designed, the Ennis House in Los Angeles, where Wright was already starting to uh, look at Aztec uh, and Mayan um, architecture and, and create uh, motifs around the buildings with them. Uh, but Morehouse uses the same technology, but with uh, almost with a kind of a, a fountain-like uh, motif on it. Uh, this, uh, this is the same kind of pattern and it's a real mix-up. So it's really hard to categorize uh, or to put um, Dunkelberger's bridges in one category because he's really uh, speaking a number of languages at once uh, with his bridges. Now, one of the things that the Merritt Parkway bridges are really renowned for is their massing. And by that, I mean the, the sculptural qualities of the actual forms of the concrete themselves. And, and here, Dunkelberger was borrowing from contemporary architecture in New York City. Um, in particular, um, the Art Deco massing of buildings like the Chrysler Building and Empire State Building, but also uh, Rockefeller Center, um, really in the kind of simplicity of, of, the, of the massing. Now, buildings at this point 
were under a new zoning, a relatively new zoning code that required um, buildings to set back um, to allow uh, light and air down onto the street level. And so architects were playing with that um, by treating the whole buildings as works of sculpture at this point in time, as an artist like uh, Cook in the center here um, were, uh, were really fascinated by the kind of shadow uh, play that was going on with these buildings. And, uh, and Dunkelberger does, uh, works with this on a number of bridges on the pylons. This is one of my favorite bridges, uh, Riverbank Road um, in uh, Stamford, uh, which was uh, condemned by the Museum of Modern Art at the time in an exhibit um, in 1940 um, as, uh, as not being, um, arch uh, uh, not being a, a true expression of its structural system. And that it wasn't, but it was an exuberant uh, demonstration of, of what you could do with concrete um, and shadow play on a bridge. Um, another bridge just slightly less exuberant than a riverbank is Congress Street in Fairfield, um, which is a, a kind of a more staid version of that, but he's you know, still fooling around with setbacks and a lot of shadow play. Uh, the balustrade is gone here uh, completely. It's just a series of, of uh, patterns that, uh, that cast shadow uh, as it spans the, uh, the highway. And um, Newfield Avenue Bridge, um, which um, it has got some really wonderful detail on it, um, is, uh, uh, is a bridge to really take a, a slow drive uh, by. Um, this was restored a couple of years ago too um, and it's in pretty good condition right now. Um, here, Dunkelberger uses, um, balances both the, the verticality uh, on the pylons with uh, some prominent horizontal uh, features uh, introduced across the bridge. Another view of, of that bridge and uh, its cartouche in the, in the center of it. Um, East Rocks um, in uh, Norwalk, uh, is at the top of a hill, and um, and I'm not sure if, if this is a fountain motif. It, it sort of suggests it to me, uh, superimposed on a very vertical uh, Art Deco design um, in the background. Now, uh, a lot of the bridges that you, you pass over uh, on the parkway, uh, you really have to live in the neighborhood to be familiar with them. And Dunkelberger sort of drew a distinction uh, between uh, vertical uh, bridges with a lot of verticality in them that he placed near the top of rises. If you've driven the parkway, you'll know that it's very different than the Hutchinson River Parkway uh, because the, par the hutch goes through a river valley. But once you cross into Connecticut, you're going across a series of ridges uh, up and down like a roller coaster. Um, in fact, um, it really uh, couldn't have been built there much earlier than the 1930s because automobile transmissions probably couldn't have handled it at that time. Uh, and, and certainly brake cl clutches and, and brake uh, pads couldn't have either. And, um, and so uh, where he, Dunkelberger found a, a place that was in a low area, he tried to express the, um, the, the, down, uh, the downgrade uh, with horizontals, which gives these bridges what some scholars today consider art moderne. Both art deco and art moderne are, uh, are architectural, um, are terms uh, used by architectural historians and, and decorative art historians. Uh, they were never used by their contemporaries. Uh, uh, Dunkelberger wouldn't recognize those terms today, uh, but they're a way of sort of sorting out um, different uh, Currents within the same movement, and uh, and art moderne was a little sparer than than uh, um, uh, than art deco. It used more curved elements, and it used a lot more horizontal elements than art deco. And one of the most exuberant art moderne bridges is in Stratford, um, Main Avenue. This is the last bridge you cross over the parkway before you hit the Sikorsky Bridge. And I really urge you to get off at the last exit. Um, uh, before you hit the bridge and drive under this bridge because it's an absolute delight. Um, it is one of the wildest uh, bridges on the parkway. Um, 
And you really have to be off the parkway to appreciate this one. Uh, Wire Mill Road is another uh, bridge that uh, makes use of curves. Um, this one actually has um, a, a curve profile that kind of reaches out on both sides um, to embrace the traffic as, as you're entering it. Um, it's kind of grown up uh, today, uh, and it was originally uh, polychromatic in, in the uh, different uh, uh, mortar mixes that were used uh, to give it a different uh, coloration. Um, and uh, this is uh, the upper photograph is before its restoration. Um, the, the lower photograph is um, with its restoration now in need of, of re-restoration, more or less. Now, Ferrari's, uh, Ferrari's taste in relief work um, that, was, that was put on the parkway um, at Dunkelberger's instruction was extremely eclectic. Um, there's really no pattern to it. Um, it's all very high quality work, but um, it's a very, very wide assortment of, of details. Um, the owl here that is on one of those lower bridges that you cross over, you can't see the owl from the parkway, uh, but if you uh, are on Hillside Road in Fairfield, um, you uh, and we get, we have, this owl probably has one of the largest fan clubs of any detail on the parkway from the neighborhood in Fairfield that it uh, that appreciates it. But, uh, you know, this, uh, some of uh, Ferrari's ornament is uh, some of his plaster molds are represented here on the cover of uh, the Highway Department's uh, magazine uh, in 1940. Uh, what uh, the, the way that the plaster uh, the, uh, the the relief uh, ornament was introduced onto the uh, parkway uh, was mostly when it was in an isolated kind of area um, was for, through uh, reverse plaster molding. And uh, that is a process where Ferrari in his studio would uh, either create a, a relief profile in plaster or uh, clay and then uh, do a reverse uh, mold of that, uh, at which point was sent to a shop to have that cast in concrete. Now, precast concrete at this point was in a very early stage in the 1930s of its, uh, of its use. Um, it really was after World War II that it became uh, much, much more of a, a regular building material, both in bridges and in buildings. Uh, and uh, this is all the decorative work was, was precast panels that was put in, or most of the decorative work was. We'll see a couple of examples that were cast in place in a minute. And so uh, on the left, we have um, uh, a, a Friedlander sculpture in, uh, that's um, at the base of 30 Rock, um, the RCA building, um, and how uh, Ferrari sort of interpreted the same thing in concrete uh, on the parkway. Both, both are centered on the process of construction. Um, here, uh, Ferrari is honoring the workers that, uh, that built the bridges. Uh, most of the bridges were built by contractors to uh, the, the highway department. Um, and um, it put about 2,000 people to work, uh, many who were Italians um, and uh, immigrants in, uh, in Fairfield County. And, um, and so this was a way of honoring the, the sweat that went into these, uh, these great bridges. Um, as I mentioned before, it was the um, 350th anniversary of the New Haven colony. Um, and, um, and so uh, there was uh, one bridge, Comstock Hill, where there's very, very fine uh, relief work um, that was actually cast in place um, here. This was quite a feat. And um, uh, the, uh, the Native American on the right uh, was designed by Ferrari's, uh, Edward Ferrari's father and uh, the, the Connecticut Congregationalists on the left was designed by Edward Ferrari. Uh, one of the most interesting bridges that required a lot of um, in-place casting uh, is the Merwin's Lane uh, Bridge in Fairfield. Um, it is many people's favorite bridge on the parkway. It's certainly one of the uh, 
the least easy to categorize um, in, ter in terms of any one style. It kind of celebrates uh, the, the natural landscape of the parkway. Um, uh, it has butterflies um, on it, uh, in the, uh, both on the cast iron work and, uh, and perched on the, uh, uh, in, the, in the concrete. And uh, for reasons that, uh, that are hard to understand, um, the, the, basically the wing walls of the bridge are rendered in, uh, as if they are synthetic clabbers. Um, with, with that kind of profile. It's a, it's a delightful, uh, very, very uh, prominent bridge on the parkway. Um, the, the ironwork was uh, designed on this one, uh, molded by, um, by Ferrari, but it was cast by Kenneth Lynch, uh, who also did the gargoyles on the, uh, on the Chrysler building and eventually set up his own business in Wilton, uh, Connecticut. Another bridge that I think is one of the tour de forces on the parkway is Madison Avenue Bridge in Trumbull, uh, which is, I'm not really sure exactly what, um, what he was trying to capture here, except uh, uh, an unusual amount of shadow play and really subtlety in shadow play. But this always reminds me of a sort of a linen fold uh, panel um, that was a, a sort of a Tudor uh, detail uh, writ large on a bridge um, that was meant to look like sort of a, a folded um, cloth. And to, to do concrete and make it look like cloth uh, spanning a highway, I think is just an extraordinary feat. feat. All of this was cast in place uh, on the parkway. And the casting was very good quality. Uh, this bridge is in pretty good condition. Uh, James Farms Road is um, uh, one of the, uh, another one of the most favorite bridges of people on the parkway. Um, it, uh, it features a, a winged sculpture at the top by Ferrari. Uh, Nike's wings um, uh, was considered, this was considered a monument to the civil engineers who designed all the grades and all the bridges on the parkway. And uh, it's a really beautiful bridge. Uh, we probably need uh, in the next 10 years to replace the win wings to have them recast. Um, they are not weathering uh, very well. There, it's a, a concrete sculpture that's been out in the environment, a very rugged environment for 80 years, um, but it's just a beautifully detailed bridge. And this is a bridge that we're hoping um, in, uh, to celebrate the end of COVID, if there is such a thing, um, to uh, light, uh, just like we did in 2002 uh, in our first year of operation for our, our 20th anniversary too. Um, uh, th this is clearly um, a riff on uh, uh, the, the famous statue of Nike that uh, was copied, plaster co copies were um, made and distributed throughout the world in art schools. There was one very prominently dis displayed at, uh, in Drexel where, uh, where Dunkelberger went to school. Um, and, uh, and this is the plaster mold that, uh, that Ferrari did on the far right and, and what uh, it accomplished today. Very beautiful bridge. Now, before we end, I just want to touch on a couple of bridges that we have recently um, restored and the kind of work that, uh, that is done. Uh, this is also a, a, a deceivingly simple bridge um, with a lot of punch. It's, it's a very beautiful design. It's just a series of, of vertical uh, shadow uh, lines. Um, it, it's uh, a Reading Road Bridge and um, uh, this, this was just cleaned and uh, there, was, there was not much other work done on it. Unfortunately, the cleaning revealed some uh, patches that had been paint patches that had been used to uh, uh, cover graffiti, but, um, but we, and we decided to leave those patches um, as were as cleaned um, because we just didn't have the budget to, to go further and next round we'll attend to that. But um, just a little cleaning, and, and uh, the uh, bridges are cleaned uh, with sponge blast. Um, 
So uh, sponge is, is shot at the bridges at a very high velocity. Uh, the sponge is very soft, so it doesn't damage anything, but it does hit it hard enough to bond with uh, the soil uh, and the dirt on the bridge and, and remove it. And it's swept up and disposed of in an environmentally responsible manner. Uh, one of our, our most recent restorations um, is the Lake Avenue Bridge um, in Greenwich. The second bridge you encounter when you're coming in from the New York line. Um, this is really kind of a gateway bridge, and um, it was a kind of a wreck for a long time. Um, the, uh, the, it's one of the last bridges put in service on the parkway, and, um, and when it was uh, becoming more acceptable to the Parkway Commission to expose steel. And here, this, the exposed structural steel was screened with a, an elaborate uh, uh, cast iron uh, grill of, of grape, uh, grape vines, which is part of the state seal, um, topped by urns and then uh, with um, cartouches uh, on the balustrade uh, in, the, in the middle of the, uh, of the bridge. And over the years, uh, the, the bridge uh, was painted two different colors. Um, it was uh, repainted from its original scheme to a green, a solid green. And then uh, I guess there was some leftover paint from a bridge upstate and they painted it blue in the 1970s. And, um, and this is what it looked like by the early 2000s on the upper left. Um, uh, the Conservancy hired a paint conservator in New York, and um, she sampled the, the bridge. Uh, we were able to find traces of the original color scheme, uh, which was a sort of an olive color uh, with gold highlights um, with a black background on the structural steel, and we were able to replicate that. The, uh, all the grill work um, had to be uh, taken off. The, this bridge was structurally unsound, all the structural steel had to be replaced. So uh, we carefully disassembled the bridge, um, took it to a shop, um, basically sponge blasted every inch of original historic cast iron um, and, uh, and took it uh, down and gave it multiple coats in a shop of uh, very high quality uh, paint formulated for metal. So this, this should last uh, a little bit longer uh, than our last go arounds. And because we had to take the bridge out of service, I mean, very rarely do we actually have to take the span off a bridge. Uh, but uh, this being a major bus route in Northern Greenwich, uh, we did it over the course of the summer and we were on a very tight schedule. And I'm happy to report that even though this was an enormously complicated project, uh, we were able to finish it uh, two and a half weeks ahead of schedule. And boy, everybody was happy that day that we reopened the bridge to traffic. Um, DOT, the contractor, and the conservancy were all there at the ribbon cutting ceremony. Um, and uh, our most recent restoration is Clinton Avenue Bridge, which was a major transformation of a bridge. Uh, this is a, 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 an early photograph of the bridge, um, and on, you can see that it had these little uh, up at the upper reaches of, uh, of the pylons at the edge of the wing walls. Um, there, were this, there was this kind of diamond pattern of a darker material. Uh, those were infilled panels uh, with uh, material that had crushed red glass in it, uh, and they were uh, deep, deep ruby red. Um, against a mortar that was formulated to simulate uh, Stony Creek granite, that beautiful pink granite. If you're traveling on I-95 and you go through Guilford, uh, the, the, where the, the rock cropping comes out to the highway, uh, you see all of a sudden the, the grays of, of New Haven change to, um, to pink. And it's a beautiful color. And so um, we were able to match that in the restoration and um, uh, sim re-simulate it, refabricate the, uh, the panels, the inset panels with the glass shards in it. Uh, and this bridge really pops now. Um, it's, just a, it's just a real asset and a, a beautiful bridge on the parkway. So um, that's, that's the end of my tour. And um, if you wanna know the merit 
better. Um, the Conservancy publishes a guide to the Merritt Parkway, and um, it, it talks a little bit about the history of the bridges and some anecdotes about some of the bridges that I didn't go into tonight, uh, and uh, some other uh, features and names all the, the bodies of water that you cross. Um, and if you want, uh, would you like a, a free copy of, the, of it? Just um, contact me at my email address up here and um, I will be happy to put one in the mail. I'll need your mailing address for that. Um, and uh, um, and uh, you can enjoy the, the parkway and keep it in your glove compartment. And so that's it, Joanne, and I can now take questions. Okay, great. Uh, let's see. Uh, how, does, how long does a restoration last? That's a good question. Um, there, there are different levels of restoration. We're hoping that Lake Avenue has probably got about a 25 year uh, lifespan on it. Um, whereas Reading Turnpike uh, will, uh, Red, the Reading Bridge um, that was just cleaned, um, that will probably soil up again in another 10 years. It'll probably start to get dirty and need to be cleaned, but that doesn't require as significant an intervention. Um, and then, um, then there are the, a lot of in-between bridges. Um, so a lot of the bridges um, over time uh, had coatings applied to them. The concrete has been covered by later coatings. Uh, we're now transitioning from the old types of coatings that were used by highway departments uh, before the parkway went on the National Register uh, to mineral uh, paints um, that uh, are formulated specifically for, um, for masonry buildings in severe climates. And um, those uh, should hold up much, uh, much longer. A lot of uh, the big public murals in the 1980s by Richard Haas in New York City, if you're familiar with those, were done with the same mineral paints that we're using on the parkway now. And they've held up now for close to 50 years uh, with, without, with very little fading, uh, 40 years at least without uh, fading. So we're hoping that we can get a similar type of uh, traction under that. Uh, so how you know, the, the, the decks, the decks of the, the bridges, the spans, they're, they're the wild card. Some of them, um, you know, when they start to exhibit a lot of, of uh, corrosion of the steel, the steel has to be taken up and, and redone, but, um, but the, the, the actual concrete is holding up for the most part better than I think anyone expected when the parkway was built. So if you were to clean a bridge, how long would that be every 10 years, every five years, just cleaning it, you know, sort of like uh, with a sponge would, method? I would say that, that um, optimistically going forward after this major rehabilitation work is done on the corridor, uh, we would be cleaning the bridges about every 10 years. Um, what are preservationists doing to combat um, the invasive plant growth along the highway? Um, sometimes on highways, you know, when you hit Westchester, there's a, like the sawmill, you'll see a lot of um, invasive vines um, mostly porcelain berry that have sort of covered everything. Is there is that part of your organization, or um, are there efforts to combat that? Well, we have worked on small grants. Unfortunately, they were very small grants, and they were limited to um, very small areas um, to uh, to try to control invasives. So um, when when a when the parkway is scheduled when a section of the parkway is scheduled for uh, rehabilitation, which um, that work includes the new uh, guide rails that are put in. Uh, it includes a slight widening of the traffic lanes um, and it includes new drainage uh, underneath the, the highway to, to accommodate the, um, the greater rains that we're getting, frankly, um, in, in the last few years. Um, there is a part of that contract that comprehensively cleans out the invasives. So uh, right now, if you drive on Norwalk um, north of Route 7, 
uh, on, on the parkway, uh, the Route 7 interchange, you'll see that that area has been entirely um, cleaned up of invasives. Those invasives come back at a really astonishing rate. And, um, and so there's no mechanism right now within DOT to, uh, to, uh, to provide funding to manage that. The Conservancy in past years has gotten small grants to do limited areas where we've hired a contractor to go in there and do that. Um, it, that, that process was too small and it wasn't permanent enough. So uh, we are really rethinking that right now. Uh, we're working with DOT on a new vegetation management plan that's gonna deal with invasives, it's gonna deal with resiliency. Um, some of the trees and, that are there are, um, are, are basically too old and we need to start uh, replanting for succession for some of the hardwoods. Um, we need to take out a lot of the trees that are damaged uh, just by insects. Uh, we know the white pines and the ash trees are, have a very short life expectancy at this point on the parkway. So it's th those kind of uh, management issues that we're looking at. And also integrating that with new methods of mowing and actually planting the areas that need to be mowed. Uh, mowing is extremely disruptive to traffic. Um, uh, we should be using robotic mowing in the median so we don't have to shut down a travel lane right now. DOT doesn't have a lot of funding to do that kind of stuff. So that's gonna be up to us to take the lead to encourage the people of Fairfield County and greater Connecticut to push for that on the parkway. As uh, trees are removed, is there an original landscape plan that sort of dictates their restoration? There's, uh, there is, um, when the parkway was planted, it's very interesting. The, um, the landscape architect didn't work off a plan. He basically drew um, an area in the dirt and stuck trees, tree branches in it of what he wanted. And those were his instructions to the, um, to the, the crews that were planting. And you know they weren't very permanent documents. They kind of got removed the first time the bulldozers came over them. So um, we, uh, in the 1990s, there were landscape guidelines put in place. Um, there was an analysis, a very comprehensive analysis of what the original planting was like on the parkway, what worked and what didn't. I mean, some of the original plants on the parkway just didn't work. It was overly planted with mountain laurel and mountain laurel proved to be very um, salt intolerant. And, and so uh, we lost a lot of the mountain laurel. We lost a lot of the dogwoods to a blight at, at, at one point too. So uh, right now there's, there are guidelines to replant. And those guidelines are followed during these rehabilitation phases. So uh, Norwalk, um, probably in April, um, at the last job meeting, they, we were talking about rescheduling or scheduling uh, to initiate planting along that Norwalk stretch that's under construction right now in April. So you'll start to see uh, trees going back on the median. Um, you'll start seeing trees going back on the shoulders in different areas. And we're trying to introduce, you know, enough understory so there's some color in there in the spring and the fall uh, when the understory really does, you know, sort of get showy. And natives, will you be planting sort of native trees to the area? We, we, we plant mostly natives and, and the parkway was originally planted with mostly native and, and we're trying to uh, plant with trees that are positive pollinators. Um, and uh, because the, the, it's in 39 and a half mile uninterrupted pollinator corridor. And, um, and so um, it's a very important asset in that respect too. Um, and so, uh, yeah, we, we are doing that. And it's a very limited uh, schedule of planting material. And then we have to adjust, I mean, uh, so native beech trees, um, uh, right now uh, the, uh, the nursery stock has, wherever we've contacted has got some sort of blight going on with the, with the tree. 
And so we've scheduled a lot of planting of, of beech trees, which are beautiful in the wintertime because they hold those pale leaves. Um, we, uh, but we, we have to change to another species. So we're trying to change to another similar size species that will be tolerant. So we have to adjust to market conditions too, as well. So we have, we have a plan, there is a plan in the form of guidelines. It doesn't locate each tree, but it, it basically says these should be clustered in this kind of grouping here and there. Mm -hmm. And who was the original landscape architect, the name? Um, his name uh, was... Um, uh, Putting you on the spot, sorry. Yeah, I'm, I'm drawing a blank right now. No so worries. Bridge mode right now. It'll, it'll circle back to me in a minute. I think someone's written in Thayer Chase. Is that yeah. Okay. Well, there, Chase. Yes. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank Whoever you. you were to write in for that. <laughs> Peter. Thank you, um, Peter. Um, oh, is that Peter Vitoretto, perhaps? It's not, but um, oh. two more questions. I have, uh, what is the most common cause of damage to the bridges? And that, along with that, um, how does one go about removing concrete wings specific to the, the bridge in Stratford, the James Farm Road? I mean, how do you remove those wings? It seems like a, a really hard task. Well, they're, they're, they, were, they were a separate casting that was placed on, on top there. So they're doweled in. So, okay. you know, yeah. So we would, we would basically, um, they're like a statue set on top of something. So we would handle it like a statue. Um, and then uh, the, the most common damage to the, the, to the bridges, well, <clears throat> there's the long-term damage, which is just moisture, which is just rain getting in uh, to cracks, taking advantage, getting in, rusting the steel. When steel rusts, it expands, it pops out, it cracks the, um, the concrete. That's a kind of a long, slow boil uh, problem that's a major threat. But that, that exists for every bridge everywhere that mixes concrete and steel together. Um, but the short-term damage, the one that would be controllable, is uh, is vehicles hitting the the, um, mm. is the, the park uh, the bridges, and um, and that is uh, uh, you know trucks are banned. They were they were banned because this was a dedicated car route, um, and it wasn't really that much of a problem until GPS came along, and um, Commercial truck drivers who pay for a subscription uh, for commercial uh, truck GPS, their GPS is programmed to not drive you to the parkway when traffic backs up on I-95. But the stuff that you get free on your phone, and if you go and rent a truck, you don't have any idea that, um, that you're not supposed to be there it, especially if you're getting on the parkway and you're looking at your phone and you don't see the big sign that says trucks not allowed or commercial vehicles will not allow. So um, we are getting too many uh, truck strikes uh, on the parkway. Um, it's, it's come down to, it's about 1.75 per month uh, is the rate of truck strikes right now. And they're hitting a couple of, of bridges. Fortunately, a King Street Bridge, which is under the jurisdiction of New York DOT, stops most of the trucks coming in from New York. Um, they just can't, the trucks can't get under that bridge. They, they're, they're destroying that bridge, but they can't get on the parkway, the Merit to destroy the Merit. Um, a lot of trucks get on at Route 7 um, when they, they find that, you know, that's just the way to get on the Merit. So um, we're getting, uh, the uh, East and West Rocks bridges um, are getting hit. And a lot of trucks enter uh, the Wilbur Cross and uh, uh, the I-91 interchange with the Wilbur Cross. Uh, so, um, you know, if you see a truck uh, report it, um, the, the state police are hoping to increase enforcement um, on the parkway and in the upcoming years. And, uh, and we, we really need to get the trucks off the the highway. Yeah. Were there old toll, toll booths on the bridge? 
Yes. Yeah, I mean, on, were, on the highway, on the parkway, sorry. Yeah, there were there were toll booths both at the uh, um, Stratford end and the Greenwich end. Uh, and uh, two of them still survive. One is in Stratford um, in Booth Park, which is just south of the parkway. Uh, if you get off to see that wild uh, main avenue bridge in, in Stratford, uh, the really you know beautiful one with the big uh, curves on it, um, turn around after you see that bridge, head south towards Booth Park and one of the original Merritt Parkway uh, toll booths is there. The other one is at the Henry Ford Museum in uh, Michigan. Um, they were like little log cabins um, and uh, they were very adirondack -y in, in character. Excellent. And one last question. Has the um, sort of onslaught of severe weather sort of hasten the you know deterioration of the bridges on the merit um i, I we we haven't had too much damage from, from uh, i think the onslaught of uh, climate change is is changing the vegetation more than it is the bridges i i you know it's a threat to the bridges too because if a big tree comes down on a bridge but um the the trees aren't we're, we're trying to keep the trees away from the bridges um and that's the main resiliency issue there. Um, there, you know, there's more water that comes down now um, in more in larger quantities in in a shorter period of time. Uh, but that's not uh, an immediate threat to the bridges. Um, it, it really is more to the trees. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you, everyone, for attending this evening's programming event. Thank you for all the love. You have quite a few wonderful uh, comments here in the chat box if you want to read them, uh, Wes, to yourself. And thank you, Wes, for your uh, great presentation. Thank you, Museum of Darien, who also sponsored this. I hope you've gained some insight into the beautiful parkway just north of here, the Merritt. Thank you again, and good night, everyone. Thank you. Good night, Joanne.